Well, uh, it's great to be here as well. Um, it's always nice to see some friendly faces, and uh, I guess after being in the business for about 20 years, more of them, get to know more of them, been in some of my classes. Um, in fact, today, a uh, very important student is here, um, Alice. Where are you, Alice? Oh, there you are, right down here in the front. So I saw Alice today and um, reminded me, actually, that more than 12 years ago, <laughs> she was taking my advanced wine chemistry class. And at the end of the quarter, we were discussing what students learned, what they didn't learn. And she said, well, I learned a lot, Professor Waterhouse, but I didn't learn much about oxidation. And I wish I'd learned more about that. And that actually got me interested in, I thought, well, she's right. And we really, I need to get more of that into the class. So started looking into that. I got interested in it. So we can blame Alice for today's lecture. <laughs> now, the, the data I'm going to present, the, the ideas I'm going to present, actually come not just from me, but from other people I've been working with. And I do have to mention several of these people, of course, work at uh, Nomocork. Uh, some are worked in my lab, but I want to bring, specifically mention Steph, because the, the concept I'm going to be presenting today really came from his, um, his ideas, and, and, uh, and so really have to give him special recognition for that. So <clears throat> there'll be a short quiz afterwards. <laughs> so this is a little map of wine oxidation, and I, I, want, to, I want to draw your attention to a couple of key steps. And the, this throws in some details, but really, this is the same map that Vern Singleton proposed you know, 30 years ago. And so there's several key steps. The oxygen comes in, goes through these uh, complicated steps, then you get to quinones. And the quinones are not this quinone, but a whole bunch of quinones from epicatechin and catechin and the tannins and so on. And, and all of them react similarly, and they can react with all kinds of things. And really understanding and managing part of oxidation at this stage is understanding what this reacts with and how fast, and can we get it to react with more or less with this or that. One of the key things this reacts with is SO2. So when you have lots of SO2 present, one of the things you're doing is you're preventing other reactions, which would do things like remove 3 mercaptohexanol, uh, which is the other big reaction here, uh, reacting with sulfur-containing compounds. So by balancing more, more SO2, then you prevent those other reactions, which would scavenge fruity aromas. So besides the quinone, what you do get is hydrogen peroxide. And then that can react with iron, again, off to the races and produce aldehydes, a whole bunch of stuff. Now you can prevent that as well by our magical preservative, SO2. So SO2 actually reacts with these two key components and essentially reverses the effect of oxygen consumption. Okay, so that's how SO2 actually works. It doesn't react directly with oxygen at all. What it does is react with these two key intermediates. And if you remove these completely, uh, then you can essentially stop oxidation, as it were. Okay? And so managing it has to do with understanding that like, we manipulate these steps. So <clears throat> the key thing is that oxygen is consumed. Okay? So when oxygen goes into a wine, we don't just stop reactions from occurring by adding some preservative. We're actually having oxygen being consumed. Okay, And we have the quinone reactions that are very important, and we have the Fenton reactions that are important. In some cases, we actually want these to, uh, to proceed. Okay, So getting rid of some of those reductive characters like H2S actually has to do with getting the quinone to react with that. So when we do an oxidative pump over, what you're actually doing to get rid of that reduced aroma is you're producing quinones by injecting huge amounts of oxygen. And then that reacts with H2S and is scavenged out of the system. Also, color development, which Dr. Kennedy will be talking about, is based on producing some aldehydes and other related ketones and so on that actually facilitate color development. So we don't want this just to stop completely. We actually want to be able to manipulate things. So to get started, we need to know, if we're going to do an experiment, say, in a bottle, we need to know how much oxygen is consumed. And it turns out that's very difficult to do. Uh, we need to know how much oxygen is coming in. And <clears throat> we need to know how much got in there at bottling, um, how much is coming from the closure, 
how much is transferring through the closure. Um, and then we can subtract the residual oxygen. So by, in our lab, actually, what we do is we actually measure residual oxygen with the, that Nomasense gadget that you'll see later. Um, and then that tells you how much oxygen is consumed. So that's how we can measure oxygen entering the bottle. We, okay, so if we can, can nail this down, in the past, this hasn't really been possible to measure the oxygen entering the bottle until we got to these essentially very reproducible, what I would call high performance closures. And this is data from one experiment published by some folks at Nomacork. And we actually use this data in our experiments. So what you can see here is there's, um, here there's data from six different closures, two different types, classic and premium. And the key thing about this is that the amount of oxygen that gets through the closure and accumulates in the bottle is virtually identical between individual samples of the closure. So what that, what that tells you is that you can now predict in an experiment that we would run, right, how much oxygen is getting into the bottle. And then by measuring residual oxygen, we can say how much the wine has consumed. So we can estimate, so we can estimate what we call total consumed oxygen in an experiment where we use hundreds of closures and we're relying on the, the reproducibility of these closures to estimate for every single bottle how much oxygen has reacted into the wine, okay? So we're using that data to predict how much has gotten in and then we can measure residual oxygen and the balance is how much has been consumed, all right? So we're, I'll show how we've applied this technology to an experiment. So <clears throat> we did an experiment with Chardonnay, and we actually we did some other experiments as well. I'm going to focus on this one experiment. And we did some treatments of the wines that might be very typical for a Chardonnay, which is we, we did a little barrel aging, and we used a stainless barrel and an oak barrel to see the difference between those two types. And then we did this with lees and without lees. So a real basic experiment and trying to see what the effect of lees aging was versus non-lees and barrel versus oak barrel versus stainless. We then looked at four different closures and we, actually two different closures, but we wanted to look at different levels of oxygen transfer. So we had the light closure, which had a very high transfer rate, and then we had premium, uh, which had a lower, and then to make even lower rates, we then took those bottles with the premium closures and put them in barrels where we had gas inside that had less oxygen. In one case, none. We used nitrogen. and In another case, we had 4% oxygen. So we had four different closures, four different wines, 16 different legs of the experiment. And uh, I put down here we did an accelerated aging experiment, so we bottled with lots of oxygen. Stop laughing, sir. <laughs> That wasn't our original intent, but after we did the bottling, <laughs> as I'm sure many of you experienced, then we had an accelerated aging experiment on our hands. Okay. <clears throat> and we measured a bunch of things. So we measured oxygen, binomasense, carbonyls. We have a method we do that, phenolics, SO2. And I'll just show you a little bit of the data. So here we've got oxygen levels going down in one of the legs of the experiment, and we've got our different closures. And this is dissolved oxygen. So you can see we started at a very healthy oxygen dose, uh, and which went down as we'd expect over time. And headspace oxygen went down more slowly, and it got down pretty low levels. Um, the, the closures that were the, the light, though, because this wine uh, doesn't consume oxygen very quickly, um, actually had measurable residual oxygen. So there was enough oxygen coming through the closure we could still measure oxygen in the bottle after a, literally a year, okay? Now, taking that data and the data we knew what, how those closures would perform, we could calculate total consumed oxygen. So here you can see the numbers going up. So this is the light closure. You can see, wow, there's, it's, this wine has consumed lots of oxygen. You see almost 20 ppm. So this is a lot of oxygen getting in and being consumed. It's what you'd expect. It's a light closure. You're getting a lot in. We started with lots of oxygen, <laughs> right, to start. And 
the premium much less. And then these here, you can see there's some oxygen coming in from the closure itself, but then um, the oxygen coming through the closure is, is very low here, just basically flat, right? So these are bottles in tank or in, in barrels full of nitrogen. So at some point we run out, there's no oxygen left, okay? So we have these four different wines. Then, of course, we also measured SO2, as you would expect, right? <laughs> and you can see that we started with a reasonable amount, um, and the levels uh, fell pretty fast, uh, which is what you expect with our bottling uh, technique, special bottling technique. And then when we get down to around 10, the levels uh, sort of flatten out. In other words, if you go back to this, you can see the oxygen still streaming in, right? But this seemed surprising. The free SO2 is sort of stopped, stopped declining. So we're like, well, that's odd. Well, what's, what's going on? And so I think part of what we discovered here is trying to explain what's going on, okay? So <clears throat> now that we had this new information, the ability to measure the amount of oxygen actually consumed in the bottle meant we could now compare that to other things. So here we're comparing we want to compare the amount of oxygen that's reacted with the amount of SO2 that's been consumed, all right? So if we have a chemical reaction, a pure, purely stoichiometric chemical reaction, right, then we would have two molecules of SO2 react with one of oxygen and giving us two of this. This is actually sulfuric acid. It basically just turns into sulfate in a wine, um, giving us a mass ratio of four to one. So for every milligram per liter of oxygen that's consumed in a wine, that would predict that four milligrams per liter of SO2 is going to disappear, okay? If nothing else is happening, if the only outcome is sulfur dioxide consumption, you get a four to one mass ratio, okay? That's a good number to keep in your head. So <clears throat> if we have exactly four to one, we have a balanced reaction, nothing else is happening, okay? The SO2 is consuming all the oxygen, no oxidation, no, none of the other products are being formed, all right? But below four, we start getting other oxidation reactions occurring. So below four, then other things are gonna happen. We're gonna start getting some aldehydes, we're gonna start getting some loss of thiols, and the question is, and we don't know the answer to this, you know, sort of what's, what's best. But at least this point now, we have a new parameter to actually look at. So <clears throat> to remind you, how is this happening? If we have um, two molecules of SO2 for every one of oxygen, where are they actually working, okay, to remove oxidation is one of them is picking up a quinone molecule, one of them is picking up hydrogen peroxide. So that's how those two SO2s per oxygen are being consumed, okay? So if we have enough SO2 around, this is what's gonna happen. The peroxide that will be formed, but it'll be immediately consumed, converted to water, gone. And any quinone form will be immediately reduced back to the catechol, so there's no net oxidation. We're losing SO2, but it's doing its job. Okay, now what did our data show us? So this data is calculated by looking at all the free SO2 that was consumed during a year versus all the oxygen that was consumed during a year. And what we have are some pretty surprising numbers. Um, you'll look, if you look at the graph, the numbers are between two and three. And in this particular case, this wine was an even special special in our special bottling. It had less SO2 than the other wines. We had a, a ratio of near one. Now, if you think about it, okay, with a, with a ratio of one, right, that means lots of other oxidation products are being formed, right? The SO2 is doing a very poor job, right? So a lot of the oxygen going in is going into these other oxidation products. And guess what? The sensory panel reported that these wines tasted oxidized. How about that? <laughs> also, the other analysis we did showed lots of other oxidation products. Now, there was some... We, of course, we, looked at, we knew that was gonna happen. We looked at the other data and looked at it, and there was a pattern that came out, which is that the Lee's aged wine had a higher ratio, consistent between all of our treatments. And this seemed very, I mean, it's just, it just stood out, and like, well, 
okay, what, what could explain that? How could Lee's aging actually act as a preservative in a way? What you're doing is you're saying that, you're, that the SO2 is working better in a Lee's aged wine. Um, winemakers, now maybe some of you don't feel this way, but I had, have had uh, various winemakers tell me that when they do Lee's aging, they feel that that acts as a preservative to the wine, that it doesn't oxidize as quickly. And that's not something I would have thought of as a chemist. <clears throat> but when we started looking you know, through the data, what's different, we did notice that consistently the Lee's aged wine had less pyruvic acid. Well, what's pyruvic acid? Well, it turns out it's, a, it's very similar to acetaldehyde, and it binds to SO2, but it doesn't bind as tightly. Okay? And it turns out there's a number of other compounds that we didn't measure. We did happen to measure pyruvic acid. Um, that have a binding with SO2. Now, we did an experiment and where we took, uh, we actually create a quinone chemically, and then we add SO2. And we can watch the quinone rapidly disappear. Okay? So this is our control reaction where we add, um, so we generate the quinone in a solution, and then we throw in SO2, and we watch the quinone disappear. Okay? Goes very quickly, in fact, the, you can see this is an 11 seconds, so the, the postdoc doing this really had to get her technique in shape before we got good data, okay? <laughs> so we had lots of data that was meaningless until we got this going, okay? So the quinone, okay, so that also tells you this SO2 reacts very quickly with quinone, okay? So it's very effective. But when we added pyruvate, we actually were able to basically just stop the reaction. So the quinone, I mean, the, um, the pyruvate is binding to the SO2 enough to create a bound form that just doesn't work, doesn't react. Um, so <clears throat> what we think is going on is that there's other things besides acetaldehyde uh, that bind SO2 and do bind it such that um, it actually isn't available as a protective material. But it is a very fast equilibrium, so this stuff will break down fast enough so that when you're doing a titration to measure free SO2, some of this actually is released. And so the free SO2 measurement actually is showing a number, right? But what, it's, what you're seeing is, is SO2 that's been released from something. We don't know if it's pyruvate or, or one of the other weak binding materials, so that in the wine, there's actually very little free SO2 available to, as a protective material when oxidation occurs. But when you do a titration, there's long enough time there to release it, and you get this number that tells you you've got free SO2 when, in fact, you don't. And I think this is why virtually all of you, in fact, Malcolm even pointed this out, are worried when free SO2 gets to around 10, because probably you're really not having any protection because that SO2 that is showing up in the analysis is actually not available. And so, as I've pointed out, I think the effect of barrel aging on lees is that actually the, the bacteria or the yeast are actually consuming, breaking down, <coughs> excuse me, these aldehydes and ketones so that the wine is actually better protected or seems to be better protected with the same level of free SO2. All right, so what can we do with this? Well, I think this might actually be a new way to measure whether or not a wine is protected, okay? Now, it's not a simple measurement. So you could determine your own SO2 consumption versus oxygen consumption ratio, okay? But you'd have to put the wine in a bottle and then wait and, you know, measure oxygen or, or measure sulfur dioxide at the beginning and end and make sure you have the right closure and all that. It could be done. Um, and it, it's probably predict, predictive of whether the wine is going to develop oxidized character or not. Um, but it's, you know, at this point, it's really a speculative idea that this might be a good way to measure the protection of wine by SO2. Um, <clears throat> of course, it would be much better if we actually do a single measurement and on a single day, and actually we would know whether or not the wine is going to be protected. So, Frankly, what we really need is, you know, a better way of measuring free SO2 that actually is linear so that, you know, if you get a number of 20, it's twice as good as a number of 10 as opposed to 
somewhere in there, you know, you fall off the cliff and you don't have any protection and you don't know where that is. So that's sort of the situation I think today. Um, but we're interested in pursuing this question. Um, but I think what we have now is really um, a very new, good new parameter that is quite informative, total consumed oxygen, tells us what's really going on uh, in a bottle, and it's, but it's only really feasible when you have closures that are very consistent, so you can sort of predict what's gonna happen in each and every bottle. Um, and then I think it seems to us that this ratio of consumed oxygen versus consumed uh, sulfur dioxide, free SO2, could be a good way of assessing whether a wine is protect protected from oxidation or not. And, you know, ratio of four, no oxidation should be occurring. Below two, our data shows us they're getting pretty oxidized. But which of these numbers is actually, you know, where each wine should be, of course, is a, a matter for future research, right? Um, and to conclude, I think I ought to say that free SO2 measures um, need some improvement, and uh, we're very interested in that. So I'd like to conclude there, and thank you for your attention, and I think we're going to go to a break, correct? Thank you. Thank you.